Welcome to part three of Getting Started with Outdoor Learning. We're back again. Our first video you might remember was about stepping out the door, covering the logistics and the supplies and the routines. The second gave you a bunch of simple activities to do outside. And now part three, we're gonna talk about a different approach and knowing what to expect. So this is for those teachers who are ready to do a little bit something different outside. So we've titled this Creating Time and Space for Discovery. And for those of you wondering if this video is for you, this is once you've, you're ready to move beyond just taking motor breaks outside, taking your math lesson outside, and you're really ready to go outside and teach using nature. So rather than just teaching in nature, teach actually using nature and with a less structured format and more just having exploratory time, adventure time together as a class. And the reason we chose this picture for the opening slide, this girl with her woolly bear caterpillar crawling across her finger, is just at these really special moments, just taking the time to have this caterpillar crawl across her finger is something that um, is so important. And we're gonna help you figure out how to create time and space for this and the sort of different approach, the different mindset that is needed to create these opportunities in the classroom. So what is a different approach? We picked five things to really focus on in this video. And the first one is to model a sense of wonder. The second one is students make the discovery, which is a real shift from typical teaching and teachers can encourage exploration. The third one, is to expect the unexpected and take advantage of these special moments. You never know what's gonna happen after you walk out those doors. Fourth is that outdoor learning looks different. It's loud, it's messy, it's active. It applies, appeals to a different learner than a traditional classroom, which is great, but it also takes a different approach from the teacher. And the fifth is that healthy risk-taking. Kids need to take risks and they need to learn how to do them safely. So we'll cover things like tree climbing and jumping and walking on slippery logs. All right, so the first kind of big picture change in your approach when you're taking your kids outside is to model a sense of wonder. So you're gonna be exploring with your class. It's if you notice the teachers in these pictures, they're all down at eye level with the students. They're really looking up close at what the students have found. It's less about teaching information and more about exploring together with the class. Share your enthusiasm for exploring the natural world. Get really excited with the kids, ask them questions. And don't worry about naming everything. This is a really common hang up that's easy to feel when you're outdoors and kids are asking you what they found. Don't worry about coming up with a name, just observe, encourage your kids to observe even more closely. So when some of them come up with a leaf and they say, what kind of tree is this from? Say, I don't know, let's go check it out and go, go feel the bark, feel the texture of the different bark. Look around at the trees nearby. Are, are all the different kinds of bark the same on each tree? Um, hold the leaf and count the number of points it has, the number of lobes, or how many pine needles seem to grow in a cluster together. Um, one to look out for is bugs. Kids ask a lot about identifying bugs. Don't worry about the name, just look really closely. Oh, look at those antennas. Look at the color of the eyeballs. Can you count the legs? Anytime you give kids something really specific to focus on and observe closely um, and ask more questions about, just share your enthusiasm and don't worry about identifying. Let the kids make the discoveries. This is another shift from in a classroom where frequently the teacher is the one in the front of the room telling the students what to do. And this chant, this is when the kids are really the experts. They're really the best at finding all the interesting things outside. So your role is to just facilitate those discoveries and validate them, make them feel important when they find a bug or find, and as Sarah was mentioning earlier, counting the antenna or looking carefully at those, those discoveries that they've made. So your job is to step back from active teaching role and instead encourage and guide students as they look here closely and get curious. All right, another change from typical indoor classroom teaching is that when you're outside, you should absolutely expect the unexpected. Um, chances are when you go outside, 
something unusual will happen. Um, so really just come to expect that um, and be willing to run with it. So in these pictures here, this was on a classroom trip where we were just finishing up lunch and getting ready to start our next unit. And this little girl found a baby turtle. Um, so of course we, we paused our lesson and we all gathered around and we celebrated the turtle. We looked closely at it. It's got a really up close look, gave it a name, talked about where it had come from, where it was going. We planned a big release in the pond with it together. Um, so that's what these kids are gonna remember from the day. So really, I think take advantage of these special moments and don't try to teach through them. So don't try to ignore the moment and just get through with your lesson. Be prepared to shorten or even abandon your planned activity. And remember that perhaps you wanna structure your outdoor time in such a way that these unexpected moments actually become the bulk of your time together. Just looking around and seeing if you can find unexpected things could be the lesson. Outdoor learning is gonna look different. If you look at these three pictures, these things will probably never happen in a traditional classroom. That kid on the end is definitely messy, but he's gonna remember digging his hands in the mud and what that clay felt like between his fingers. And that kid in the middle is so excited about what he found in the pond, he just can't contain himself. Um, they have a lot more space to run and be active outside. So while those things are a little bit uncomfortable sometimes for a class, you have to accept that that's going to happen. And before you try and rein them in, make sure, because a lot of times they're still actively engaged. And this type of learning really appeals to a traditional, a non-traditional student who can't really focus in a classroom. If they can actually feel that mud between their fingers, that's what they're going to remember or hold that frog. Those active activities is really going to stick with them. So encourage that type of learning. And one last thing we want to talk about is healthy risk taking. So this is really important. Um, and when you're outside, there's lots and lots of opportunities for healthy risk taking that kids do need to learn how, how to do it in real life. Um, the key here is to know the difference between safe and unsafe risks. So here are some examples and we put them um, in descending order of risk. So there's some things that are just plain risky. Thunder and lightning, that's a risk. Getting cold and wet, if you're far from your classroom and you don't have a change of clothes, that can be a real risk. If you know that you're right outside the classroom door and you wanna jump in that puddle and you know the kids all have um, warm, dry spaces to go next, then that's less risky. But it's up to you to judge sort of the situation. Slippery logs after rain, that's that's a serious risk. So you need to just be aware of the logs and if it's rained recently, don't step on them. Now, then we go into a category of a different kind of risk, climbing trees, jumping off logs, balancing on, on logs. Climbing, jumping and balancing are normal kid activities. So while they're not encouraged in the classroom, um, they're really natural outside. So the key here is to help the kids know how to do these activities safely so that you can encourage healthy risk taking. So in this picture here of our friend who climbed up this tree, um, this is just an example of, of healthy um, learning how to use your body to get around in the world. Um, there's some crazy statistics out there. When you compare kids today to kids um, 40 years ago, only one in 12 kids has the um, normal amount of core strength. So helping kids find ways to develop this core strength and these balanced skills in their life is really important. And the outdoors provides really easy opportunity to do that. Because tree climbing is the, probably the number one risk-taking activity that we get questions about, um, we're gonna give you our suggestions. You might come up with some that work even better, but here's what we use. Uh, number one, you need to ask permission before you climb a tree. Number two, you need to have an adult checking for dead branches before you climb that tree. You need to climb only to a safe height. So you can't go to the tippy top. Um, you need to go to the safe height, which in our case is usually the height at which an adult nearby could reach you if they needed to help you get down. You need to have an adult spotter and practicing getting down is really key. So a 
a court sort of common guideline is if you can get up by yourself um, and get down by yourself, then that was a safe height. Um, so we encourage you to have really specific guidance for your kids about how to learn to take these um, healthy risks of climbing trees, which is important for their body to grow strong. And you mean make sure that you want to be prepared. You can go anywhere if you have the right clothes. So make sure that you have your students have if they're going to go outside, double check. We always have a couple extra pairs of mittens at CREA to make sure that they have warm fingers um, so that they can go outside even on those cold snowy days, which are so magical. We've had snow, we've had lots of field trips in the snow. We've had field trips when the students showed up and all of a sudden it started pouring rain. We still went outside. The students had raincoats and they had a great adventure splashing through puddles. Kids don't actually go outside in the rain very much anymore. So for them, that was a, probably one of the more memorable field trips. And they felt very proud of themselves that they could take on this challenge of learning even in the rain. So as long as you have good clothes, you can go anywhere. All right, so this is um, to wind down here. This is sort of the list of challenges. And I put challenges in air quotes because once you've figured out how you can be prepared and ex know what to expect, these don't really become as much of a challenge anymore. So here's some common ones that arise pretty reliably when you teach outdoors. Getting cold and wet. Our solution to this is remember to come in before it's too late. So before you get too cold or too wet, head back inside. Getting messy in mud, again, if you've planned for it and you have clean, dry clothes inside and a place to rinse off, it's not really a problem. Um, the challenge comes when you're not expecting and you're not prepared to get muddy. But as long as you've planned for it, you're set. Ticks and spiders, this is an absolute going to happen when you're outdoors, you will encounter ticks and spiders. Um, this is just a normal part of everyday life it, when you're outdoors, um, pretty much any day that it's not snow on the ground, you will find ticks and spiders. So just downplay this, normalize this. It's just a part of life. Um, be prepared with ticks, um, require some tweezers. Obviously you want that in your first aid kit, but otherwise it's really downplay the, the bug factor. Bees, again, you do wanna be prepared. Know which students need to have an EpiPen and have that with you. Sticks, sticks is a common, again, challenge that as long as you've agreed ahead of time upon protocols for your classroom this becomes less of a challenge so over here on the right you'll see one of our um, friends with a whole bunch of sticks and some some good ideas here this is again the guidelines that we use for using sticks you might want to limit the length of the stick have it be maybe as long as your arm um, one hard and fast rule that we use is you can never point sticks at people that's absolutely just a, a given rule for us and also maintaining a safety bubble when you're around others. So a safety bubble with your stick. Um, and that means just that your stick, no matter where you put it, isn't within reach of any other students. Um, again, back to our list here, throwing snowballs. Just have a target that someone's aiming at instead of aiming at each other. If you agree on a target to throw the snowballs, um, then snowballs become less of a challenge. And distractions. Again, air quotes around distractions because if a squirrel falls out of a tree right in front of your lesson, um, that could be a distraction or it could be the most exciting part of your day. So you wanna really embrace those distractions and run with it and just turn it into part of your, your learning together as a classroom. All right, and this is the end of our slideshow. So go for it. We hope that this has given you a little boost of inspiration. Maybe you've been teaching outside for a long time and you just needed to change something or you thought, I really want to go outside, but this is what's holding me back. Hopefully we've given you some ideas about solving some of those problems and you can make this happen. It's fun and it's engaging and healthy and great with your kids. So hopefully you'll get a chance to go out some more the rest of the school year. A couple of things that we think you should remember as you embark on these adventures is make sure you set aside a time. So if you have it in your regular schedule, just like you have math, just like you have literacy, it will happen. Maybe you have a tree Tuesday or a forest Friday, or you spend your morning meeting outside on Mondays, or 
you go outside after recess, which is really helpful, especially with young kids in the wintertime. You only have to put on the snow clothes once if you take your recess and extend it for 15 minutes for a walk in the woods or half an hour. You also need to develop your class protocols. This will create a, an environment of trust among your students so that everyone can continue going on these adventures together. Just like you have protocols in your classroom, just have protocols for outside as well. And finally, remember there's lots and lots of resources out there to support you. If you're watching this video, you probably got it from the Nature-Based Education Consortium website. So there's a ton of resources there. If you're a Maine resident, the Maine Environmental Education Association also has a lot of resources for you. You can contact local land trusts. They love to help with these sorts of adventures. So hopefully this has given you some food for thought and you enjoy your time outside for the rest of the year.